great to be here, and it's great to be in conversation with this incredible group. Um, I first want to acknowledge that we are on Wichin Ohlone territory. Um, that's what UC Berkeley sits on. So just a land acknowledgement for where we are today. Um, and I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, and then we'll get going with this conversation about how the, I won't say the title, but <laughs> it's not my favorite title. But it's important <laughs> how this work is made. <laughs> um, so thank you. Our panelists are Asmat Khan, Corey Johnson, and Suki Lewis. Asmat is an award-winning investigative journalist with the New York Times Magazine, a Carnegie Fellow, and an assistant professor of journalism at Columbia. She's writing a book for Random House investigating America's air wars. Corey Johnson has been an investigative reporter at the Tampa Bay Times since January 2017. Before that, he covered criminal justice at the Marshall Project and state agencies at the Center for Investigative Reporting. Poisoned is an award-winning Tampa Bay Times investigation that exposed dangerous conditions at a Tampa lead smelter and the surrounding community. Suki Lewis is a criminal justice correspondent for KQED. In 2018, she co-founded the California Reporting Project, a coalition of newsrooms across the state focused on obtaining records from law enforcement. She hosted and reported the award-winning NPR KQED podcast, On Our Watch, which investigates the secretive world of police accountability. We're going to play um, a brief clip in a few moments once we get started with the conversation. These are all, if you're not yet familiar with them, tremendous investigations. And one of the things that is most striking to me about all of these investigations is, is the work that it took to penetrate some of the most difficult uh, agencies and bodies that investigative journalists have to engage with. Uh, we're talking about the military. We're talking about police. We're talking about private companies. Um, but what I want to start with, I want everyone to, to just share with us where these stories got their start. Because I think as journalists, we think of ourselves as, what is the story arc, the beginning, middle, and end? For all of these stories, though, there were things that needed to happen or that things that were in place before these stories could get started. So if we could start with Corey, if you can share with us how you got started on what became such an impactful investigation. Well, thank you for the question. Um, Poison kind of developed off of uh, some prior coverage we were doing on Hillsborough County and the schools. That, that We had discovered there was a problem in the local schools with the lead, lead and all the fountains that the schools had essentially covered up and uh, did, they knew about, they didn't tell parents and the like. And so as those stories were rolling out, uh, got one of those uh, calls that you want to get from a deep throat in the health department mm -hmm. who asked me to meet them someplace and they uh, I met I went to the place and they handed me a report it was about a 160 some page report but inside that report the source had earmarked two pages on lead poisoning and the page pointed out that Hillsborough County which is the county seat for the Tampa led the entire state in adult lead poisoning cases and it specifically indicated that battery recycler was to blame it didn't name the battery recycler but it said that was contributing to this trend and so from that point it was an aha moment i'd never heard of an adult lead poison case and so i was like why would hillsborough county be leading the state of florida when it's nowhere near as big as miami or some of the other you know, places. And so that kind of launched the beginning of trying to piece it together. I tried to grab every battery recycler I could find, and, uh, and ultimately then what popped out was this lead smelter that had been in our backyard that that we literally hadn't covered that uh, was like, uh hmm, a lead smelter in Tampa and adults with lead poisoning, right? And then I found an EPA report that talked about every city or every area in the nation that was out of compliance with pollution laws. And lo and behold, Hillsborough County was out of compliance. It, we were the only place out of compliance, and it was because of lead pollution. And the report specifically identified 
the lead plant as the cause for Hillsborough being out of compliance. So it was rubbing together those two facts that made, made me say, something's going on over here at this lead smelter, mm. and we need to try to figure out what's, what happened, and that's how I got started. Mm. Great. Suki, what about you? Um, well, I would have two answers to that. The first one is, for me personally, like my kind of interest in police corruption was really sparked by this story that I did and where I found this Roanart Park police officer, which is this small town um, up in Sonoma County from here, um, who was going 40 miles outside of his jurisdiction and posting up and pulling over drivers who were either going up to Mendocino and Humboldt counties or coming back, um, kind of profiling them to see if maybe they had money to buy marijuana or marijuana. And a lot of that wasn't making it into evidence collection, and there was this huge financial incentive for the town, which when they, he pulled in the money, it was civil asset forfeiture. And so I kind of you know, began to get all these allegations from drivers who basically said that this cop was ripping them off and reported on that. And through the course of that reporting, just saw how many people this one officer with bad intent had touched and it kind of impressed on me that police corruption, while they talk about, oh, the bad apple, right? The bad apple theory. Even if there is one bad apple, even if that is true, that person touches so many individuals in the course of their lives, and so, or in the course of their careers as police officers. And so when this law passed in California that promised to open up internal police records for the first time, I was so excited to, um, to understand, you know, how police accountability works, how the system that promises us all, you know, after there's a, you know, police shooting that looks really terrible, um, you know, that they are going to investigate, they're going to get to the bottom of it, the correct discipline is going to be handed out, and then I think from you know, the, many people in the public feel that that is not working, they're not seeing that accountability meet the road. And so um, we, you know, this law passed and we started kind of setting up a system to start requesting these records to get a look at that accountability system and where those failures were, where this disconnect was happening between the promise of accountability and the um, obvious lack of deliverance. And, and you decide that you, to do that with 40 other newsrooms. How yeah. did that, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, that came about because we just were like, there's 700 policing agencies in the state of California. Like, it's not like some other places where there's, you know, one major policing agency and, um, you know, then, and that's all you have to, you know, file a FOIA request with. So we were like, there's no way, like, we as KQED can do it on our own. And so we started reaching out to partners, and there were so many people who were interested in doing that work with us. Yeah, why compete when you can partner, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Asba, tell me how you're the origin of your story and what had been going on before that that prompted you to begin this reporting. Sure. So just just to, and thank you for the warm introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here at Logan. It's my first time. And so I'm looking forward to talking to all of you. But the investigation that I published is called The Civilian Casualty Files. And it was a series of stories in the New York Times and the New York Times Magazine. But it began many years ago, back in 2016. I had just finished an investigation for BuzzFeed looking at U.S. claims of education efforts in Afghanistan. And I'd done a ground sample of U.S.-funded schools, schools that the United States had claimed to have built, and looked at the reality on the ground to compare those claims that were used to help justify that war. And so, you know, I was familiar with systematically investigating on the ground, and yet another war was unfolding, the war against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And these stunning numbers were coming out with very little challenge to them. So I remember very specifically one day, you know, holding the front page. Can you pull this up a little sure. Bit? Yeah. Holding the front page of the New York Times and there was on that front page a, a very clear, you know, tens of thousands of ISIS fighters have been killed. And at the same time I'd been tracking American admissions of civilian casualties, a process it claimed was the most complex in the world, an incredible precision era weaponry that we were deploying few troops on the ground killing tens of thousands of ISIS fighters, and at the time, I think they admitted 
8 to 24 civilian deaths. And that's just not possible. And yet these claims were going un unchallenged in major papers. And there, I, you know, I was not the only one who was skeptical of these, but I needed a way to systematically investigate them. And that started with a ground sample that I spent two years doing between 2016 and 2017, visiting the sites of 100 airstrikes in Iraq to try to understand how many airstrikes were actually killing civilians. And what I found was that one in five coalition airstrikes was resulting in a civilian death, a rate that mm -hmm. was 31 times higher than what the military claimed. But the challenge for me was why were those happening? And that became the basis for the civilian casualty files. I was, you know, I had gone to great lengths to get an embed with US forces in Qatar, the sort of like nerve center of this air campaign. I turned over the coordinates for every airstrike I had looked at. And I could tell the US military, this is what I investigated on the ground. I've interviewed people, I've fact checked, I've looked at satellite imagery, I've analyzed this with online sources. And this is how many people died in an incident you claim killed no one or one person or whatever it might be. And they could respond with, well, we have access to classified military intelligence that you don't. And we believe this target to be an ISIS headquarters. Now, for that reporting, I had met a man, a survivor named Basim Razo. He was from Mosul. And in September of 2015, he woke up in his bed to see the stars over, the over Mosul instead of his roof and realized that he was the victim of an airstrike. And his wife and his daughter and his brother and his nephew were all killed. The US military uploaded a video to YouTube and called it a car bombing factory. And I really, for the uncounted, I wanted to know what happened to Bassem. And I used a kind of creative argument about imminent harm to get records on an expedited basis about what actually happened in that bombing. You know, what the military believed the target to be. And that was my first success story in getting a record. And I thought, wow, the military in boasting about its incredible precision puts out these press releases every month listing admitted casualties and the large number of casualties they were rejecting. Can I get the records are supposedly, that are supposed to exist for these some 1,300 assessments and investigations they claim to have done? And I did. You know, I had to sue the Pentagon with the help of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, which are lawyers I highly recommend. Um, but that was the, <laughs> I really love them. You have no idea what they've dealt with, not just with me, but with the military. <laughs> but that was the origin for the beginnings of the civilian casualty files, which were not just the files, they were, let's check these files. Let's not just use papers, let's look at people and let's see what actually materialized on the ground. Great, and one of the things that strikes me about all of these investigations is the question of the narrative and who controls that narrative. And there are issues of power here, completely. And can you talk about what it meant to begin to receive, whether it was the audio files, the video files, in your case, Suki, or the OSHA records, everything that you began to uncover, Corey, that began to paint this picture that, that really questioned official narratives and, and what it meant to then also, we can say, restore the narrative to those who were actually witnesses, victims, and survivors. Suki, let's start with you. Um, well, it, it's, a, it's a very complicated process, I'll say, and, and not always like in terms of, you know, practicing and, or attempting to practice, you know, journalism that doesn't do harm. I feel like there were a lot of times when I was thrown into, you know, places of quandary about that. <clears throat> and so, you know, there, there's the clear like, you know, this law made these records public they are about people's business. It is my job to report on them. So that, that all up to that point seems clear. But what happens when one of the records that I get that's about sexual misconduct by a police officer um, and I manage to identify his victim 
and reach out to her, and she doesn't want me to tell that story. And so how to balance that? He has now moved on to another department, is still working actively, and she is also an officer who used to be an explorer, so kind of moved up through policing, and she's like, I'm the one who will be hurt if you do this story. I will lose my job. Nothing will happen to him. And ultimately, that was a very convincing <laughs> to me, but I also said at some point, if I find out he has gone on to hurt somebody else, that calculus might change and might have to change. Um, and so I think while you know, exposing corruption and wrongdoing is, is definitely all of our jobs as reporters, but also understanding the, the harm that can be done and weighing those things really carefully. And you know, one of the stories that we did um, in the podcast um, was about this undocumented woman who also um, you know, could not read or write um, either in Spanish or in English and had you know, two children who were sexually victimized and she went to the police for help. And making sure that she understood exactly what her exposure was, because even if we did the story, like no matter what, the police would know who she was, like because it was from their records. So we could protect her name, we could do this stuff, but because of the details that were only particular to her, they would absolutely know. And you know, th at the time when I was reporting it, Trump was still president, and I could just envision a world very easily in which she was, you know, faced serious repercussions for speaking to us. And so we actually went back and forth with her a number of times, like had her lawyer involved in conversations with us. And um, at one point she wasn't gonna do it and said, I'm gonna wait until after the election <laughs> and see if it feels safe um, to speak. And I am so, so grateful for her bravery and willingness to do that. But obviously not everyone can or should make that decision for themselves. And so really empowering the people who are most vulnerable to have the most say in what the story is, is like something that I really learned from this project and that I think is just so important to our work. And having that time also, I think yeah. that comes up often is we do have time often as investigative journalists that, that if you're an immediate, if you're a you know, reporter that has a deadline that's next week, you're not. You can't. You can't that give narrative. them. Yeah, yeah. Corey, tell me how you went about constructing and putting together these pieces, while also then, you know, building trust with your network of sources wasn't just about getting them to tell their story, but they became active in the investigation. It was definitely an art, though, because. Um, and put your microphone a little closer to you. <coughs> it was definitely an art. Uh, it didn't start off that way. Um, uh, people can notice I have a beautiful natural tan, and um, it matters. It matters. <laughs> so a, a, a lot of the a lot of the sources, a lot of the people at the plant also had a beautiful natural tan, um, <laughs> but but um, you know it was complicated. Um, I, I wish I could have just pulled out my soul brother number five card, <laughs> and people would have start playing some African drums and welcome me in, but I promise you it didn't go down like that at all. Um, in, in fact, it was the opposite. Um, there's a history, you know, that, that a lot of folks don't talk about outside of the black community, but inside the black community, there's a lot of suspicion and hostility towards uh, a, a black person that might be a professional right. working with authority. Um, because there's this really nasty history around, uh, you know, white entities, whether it's the door-to-door -door insurance salesman or the police department or whatever, sending a, a black person to go in and do the dirty work that ends up injuring people. And so I had a very difficult time, very difficult time trying to convince people that I wasn't the FBI. Uh, and then when I said, well, no, I'm with the Tampa Bay Times, and they're like, same difference. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> but what happened, what was, what, what was the great equalizer was the fact that no one knew what the company had done to him. 
Um, and that hit the worker bee, that hit management, that hit even people at higher levels that had to work around this dust and work around these toxins and who were going in and out of hospitals. Um, and so the more we began to learn and figure out the scheme, the more we were able to knock on doors with something to offer a person like, look, I just, you can kick me out, but I promise you just give me two, three minutes to explain what we have, what we're looking into. And that began to kind of crack the ice a bit. And then even for those folks who were still resistant uh, and still fearful, and for good reason, uh, the company had a extensive surveillance program inside that plant, still does. In fact, it's ramped up since the story's published. So not only did they have cameras everywhere, uh, but they had people, worker bees, inside the plant who were like the informal eyes and ears who mm -hmm. would listen to conversations then run back and tell management, right? And so people would, I couldn't get the usual, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll call this one because people are like, oh, I don't know if you want to fool with that one. Um, and, but what, and this company also ha uh, had a uh, extensive contracts with private investigators. Mm -hmm. So one of the calls that kind of uh, shook me up one day was one of our sources who had started to get vocal, and d despite my best urgings to, you know, just kind of <laughs> chill, bro. You know, he started to get vocal about what is all this dust and what's going on here, and you know, why, am, you know, why is my toe hurting? And you know, he was doing that, and so then one day he goes to uh, goes to the clinic to get his checkup, and he notices someone following him. And they parked outside the clinic. They waited till he came out, and they followed him around. So he calls me like, "Man, I'm getting followed." And you know, I'm you know, I'm, I'm hearing it, but you know, you get those hey, the CIA put stuff in my teeth stuff all the time. So you don't really know how to to hear it. But I could hear a grown man. His lip was quivering. You know, he was really shook. And so he said, "I'm going to go." and pull, pull over to my lawyer's office. Mm -hmm. I said, well, give me a call, keep me in the loop, let me know. And so he, he called, he pulled over at the, the attorneys, the attorneys went outside uh, and they took a picture of the man's license plate. And turns out the guy was uh, an investigator with GS4 mm -hmm. who had been assigned to track him and, and follow him. So this was the fear, this was reasons why People were legitimately afraid. Um, but what what makes me somewhat proud uh, was that as the, the sources could see momentum building, you know, they could see the documents and we helped them understand and interpret what those levels meant. And they started Did you to meet with them and show them the documents. Yeah, we 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 would take, you know, so to to make it a little more succinct. OSHA gives uh, workers who work in industries around toxic chemicals, they actually do this unique thing that I, I can't, I, I wish more journalists would take advantage of because if you work around lead or cancer causing stuff, OSHA gives those workers, not us, but the workers get the privilege to get all of their biological testing and OSHA requires extensive biological testing to track if the body is getting harmed. Mm -hmm. They also require the, the plant to do extensive p internal pollution testing. Mm -hmm. So the worker can get what the levels are around them. Mm -hmm. They can get what their, what their health is looking like, with their blood lead and all the tests and any of the stuff. They can get all of that. And so once we understood that and we got a few to test that out, we began to see how outrageously high those levels were. And we could see people coming in healthy. And then within a few weeks, the metal stacking up in their blood and then they, they were getting sicker and sicker. And we then started to get the hospital records for when they went into the emergency rooms to triangulate all of that. And so once we got one or two and we got permission, I was like, can we share this? We'll redact your name, but can we? and we, they gave us permission, we then began to sit with other folks and show them and say, man, if you get these records, it may give you a better understanding of what's going on with you. And 
So that became like the momentum, piece by piece. We would then be able to get records from one group, one section, and by the time by the time the smoke cleared, we ended up with records from the '80s all the way up to current day on every area of the plant, which gave us a tremendous window where we could see where the plant just kind of fell off the rails and we could begin to see how people got injured. But it was because of that that the black folks began to kind of welcome me in a bit. And if they didn't, I called one of their buddies and their buddy said, man, what the fuck are you doing? Let the man, you know. And well, so, and it was a process that involved, I mean, it was collaborative. You needed them to absolutely. make these requests. They were empowered to request their own records. It's That's significant. It's we're not, we're there so in the middle of the narrative, but suddenly. The story can't get done any other way because it was closed off from us. And, um, and the lawyers and, and the company, they're still looking around trying to figure out who did what. So, you know, I can't really chess beat and name names <laughs> and, and all that because we got to keep our people protected. But mm -hmm. it was absolutely a collaborative mm -hmm. experience. And one last thing on that that makes me proud just as a human being. Um, the culture of the plant before I showed up was a lot of guys would get little lab results and stuff here and there, and they would just throw it away. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand it. They didn't care about it. As long as it said they could continue to work, they didn't really care. Mm -hmm. uh, but after we sat and they learned and they began to put the pieces together for themselves, when the fir very first story ran, it kind of gave me chills. I got a call that at least 18 guys as a group went up to the safety office and demanded their records mm -hmm. for the first time. And it freaked the safety yeah, office yeah, people too. out. <laughs> um, and in fact, one of the safety officers who had kind of been covering up and, and, and you know, ran out the room in tears. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was just kind of like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> And Asmat, there you are moving through this world. How do you use who you are to, to be able actually to, to penetrate these spaces with these families because you were, need, need, you were having to deal with checkpoints, you were being asked. How did you move through that world um, in order to be able to gain the access that you got with those families? Yeah, so I mean, I think you build these skills over time, um, and so I got better at it over time, but I think I think I can just speak to maybe one of the challenges, uh, you know, I encountered in this, because there were, there were so many, but mm -hmm. um, I remember at some point there was a restriction on where journalists could go in Iraq. There had been some really great investigative reporting by an Iraqi journalist, a photojournalist who had documented torture by Iraqi forces that he'd been embedded with. And those photos were made public and it was really powerful journalism. But one of the end results was that the, this is like during the war against ISIS, the Iraqi military essentially shut down access to almost every particular area. And this was a really important time when I was doing that, that ground sample. And I basically needed to meet, I needed to get to a statistically significant number of airstrikes in this, you know, cluster-based sample. So I needed to continue doing this work while everything was limited. And um, what I wound up doing was I just showed up in one of these villages. And sometimes being a woman, while people can underestimate you, and, you know, I've had embeds or places where the, some of the s service members or military will be like, little lady, please stay away from here. We shouldn't go near what this is or that. So it can have its drawbacks, but it can also have its advantages. And I remember I showed up in a town called Shora and there were Iraqi federal police there. And they were like, what are you doing here, little lady? Uh, you know, and I was like, oh, I'm just researching life under ISIS and I wanted to interview people. And they were like, wonderful, we'd like to come with you. Now, ethically, that's, that's a problem because you can't have a minder, right, while you're doing these interviews, somebody who is a local official, not just because people are going to be scared to tell you the truth and it can misrepresent their answers, but also it puts them at risk if they do tell you, you know, what they know. And so I needed to lose them. 
And I just did these interviews about life under ISIS and um, healthcare specifically. I started just asking questions about healthcare. There's so much you can talk about. <laughs> and these minders just weren't leaving. So I started to talk about dental care. Um, <laughs> because the translator I was working with, Abdullah, my friend, he, he, he had, I think he'd was a dental assistant at some point. It's unclear, but we just decided, like, we are going to bore them into leaving. And so we what asked, like, <laughs> we asked them, like, a thousand and one questions about their teeth. And <laughs> I think I'm, like, the expert in dental care under ISIS, um, a, a position nobody is vying for. But, um, you know, and then they, they left. And they were like, you can just, please, just go about doing your work. And, um, <laughs> and I finished sampling Shora. Um, and so... Certainly there are those kinds of impediments. There are, you know, people can sometimes be afraid. People are incredibly traumatized if they've been survivors of war. And there's such a delicate, there's, you have to be so delicate about this. And so I was very open and honest about what I was doing and what I would be unable to do. You know, I am not, they're used to, if anybody looks like they're a foreigner, a, oftentimes, Iraqis or Syrians will think that you're, you know, an advocacy worker or with an NGO, despite how many times you say, I'm just a journalist, I can only do this. And so you have to be really clear about what you can accomplish and, like, what interest this is in. And so, you know, there was oftentimes a delicate balancing of that. And what I used, and this is why I say you get better at it with time, what I would often use was um, translations of stories I'd published. And I would say, this is the story of this man named Bassem that I wrote. Um, here is, I would look for Arabic language clips about the stories and investigations I'd done, and I would print them out. And I would show them to people and be like, here's what this did. Um, and I would describe it to them. And I think that was very helpful in encouraging people. Um, but at the end of the day, by the time that I was doing this, the sample, the civilian casualty file sample, where I took these records that detail the basically what they saw in videos, right? What they you know, who they may have misidentified, somebody that they thought was an ISIS fighter but was really just, like, a man with his family. I would take these records and I would tell them, like, look, I have this, and I'd like to, if you're comfortable, I'd like to share it with you, and I want to hear your side of the story. And so many people, like, so many people wanted answers to what happened. Um, it was just the driving force in this. Like, I think Many people, my own editor, was just like, you're still working on this, huh? Like, <laughs> I thought you were going to pitch me something different. Um, and but he's been such a s supporter of this work. But it was that kind of years of investment came because I had met so many people who so desperately wanted answers. And they were people who were, they did not have the means to get it. And I'd found, I'd stumbled into this random means to get it involving, you know, the Freedom of Information Act and imminent harm and... Literally, I'd submitted like FOIA requests that were 300 pages long each, and and then and then fought with the. So I was able to get these records when before this. So we, I obtained 1,300 that we published online. But before this, there had been less than 20 of these ever made public. And so they're so rare to have. But I think that was, you know, telling people I sued my own government to get these, and and like like you, I know people thought you were an FBI agent. People thought I was like a spy. And I often had to explain why I had them and explain the adversarial nature of, like, suing your government to get them. But I think that built a lot of trust with people. And then also, like, a tip for people in the room, like, these interviews were not just about the worst moment of their lives right. and a bombing. They were, you know, I would sit with them for hours. And I would come back again and again, uh, oftentimes. And I would ask them about, like, the trajectory of their lives. I would start the interview, or I would certainly end the interviews, like, transitioning away from talking about anything like that to kind of bring them into a better space. Mm -hmm. But I think when you build that interest in their lives, they're more willing also to open up. So I just recommend doing like in-depth interviews with people and the stories as they want to tell them too. It's trauma-informed and I appreciate the care that all of you have, I mean, it's extraordinary because it takes a lot of time. Um, and you don't just go in and ask for the thing you're looking for. I think that is what makes so many people distrustful um, and nervous because they're thinking you're coming in and we're gonna just ask for what we want. And so um, it's critical and, and incredible, the care that you've taken. Um, I wanna play a clip. 
uh, because then I'm going to ask, we're going to play a clip from Suki's um, podcast series. Can you call 911 again, Catherine? Yes, I did. Hello, Suki. Police Department. Did you call 911 again, Catherine? Yes, I did. Every time police are called and something goes wrong. We're going to arrest you. Stop, no. stop resisting, OK? Like someone says officers used excessive force or violated their code of conduct. She was calling them for help, and they ended up brutalizing her. Police chiefs and officials usually come out and say the same thing. We're investigating. My name is Mark Simmons, an independent investigator retained by the city to conduct this investigation. This is Sergeant Jeff Ramsden, the internal affairs sergeant. We are in the internal affairs office in the room. For decades here in California, those internal investigations, which are how the police hold themselves accountable, were secret. Then in 2019, the state passed a new law unsealing some of those records. And we would finally get to find out how good are police at policing themselves. You got shot him. And he's not alive. Yes, he's not alive. I have told people things before in the past to, to make them think that shit like that was going to happen to him, just to scare him. You had taken a picture in uniform with your penis hanging out. Is that correct? Yes, sir. We reconstructed internal affairs cases, went through hundreds of hours of police tapes, and talked to witnesses and officials to understand who does the system really serve and who does it protect. We have a system where police officers fight tooth and nail to keep all of this information about misconduct away from the public. I'm Suki Lewis. This is On Our Watch, an investigative podcast from NPR and KQED. <laughs> and I want to follow up with that with all of you, um, and we can start with Suki. You know, there, there are moments in this kind of work, um, there are some times when you discover a hidden narrative um, in a document, in an email, in an audio recording that reveals something deeply unsettling about the story that you're reporting. Um, can you talk about some of those discoveries and what they meant for the trajectories of your stories? So for example, Asmat, I'm thinking about when you came across the log where the military described the airstrike in Mosul as if it were a video game. Or Corey, when you learned that workers instead of the company were tasked with keeping their own blood levels down, um, otherwise face retaliation or consequences or bonuses. Or Suki, when you first started watching and listening to the actual audio logs um, of some of these cases that we were familiar with. So let's start with you, Suki, and, and then we can continue. Um, well, th this was one of the amazing promises of this law, that we would get not only the incident reports, <laughs> which say what the police says happened, but we would get the raw audio of these internal affairs interviews and also body cam footage for incidents where officers were wearing body cams. And these internal affairs interviews were stunning to go through. I mean, we had, first of all, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of hours of tape, which is a beast to deal with. Um, but there's so much nuance in people's voices and you understand so much more about the context of the situation from an audio recording than you do from a transcript of something. And so, you know, moments where, you know, at the beginning of an interview, and this was, you know, kind of gave me chills when I heard it. I was going through the tapes that we got related to um, the police killing of Oscar Grant in 2009. And this was a, you know, an incident that was so seminal in California um, and across the nation, like really one of the first police killings that went viral um, that was captured on cell phone um, footage. And <clears throat> still so much had been secret about it for so long. And you know, we had to sue Bart to get these audio recordings and I'm listening through it and the guy who was assigned to do the internal affairs investigation, the sergeant who was you know, on duty that day, sits down with um, Officer Anthony Peroni, who was the first officer who was on the platform, um, and really kind of escalated 
the situation until it became deadly. Um, he sits down with him and he's like, you know, and his lawyer, of course, <laughs> um, and says, so, you know, we have a close working relationship with you, to, with each other, you know, do you mind if I do this interview? So they have this close working relationship, they're friends, and he's asking the officer if he minds. And so it's like whose interests are protected? And you just hear in that one exchange whose interests are being protected in this interview. They are not the public's interests. They are not the person who has been shot and killed's interests. They are the officer's interests. And so just those little moments that kind of crystallize, and you just hear them, and you know like what's going on and what the power setup is. Um, you know that they, there was another moment that really stood out for me in the tape where I was going through, there was this guy who's a CHP officer down in Southern California, and he would do like VIN registration checks for people. People come in with their car, and they're just trying to like get their VIN registration figured out so that they can go get their car registered, and just kind of like this bureaucratic like customer service thing they got to deal with. And he would kind of use his position to then you know hit on women and say, oh, I'll pass your car if you go on a date with me, or if you sleep with me, or if you go to a motel with me that's just down the road. Um, and there is this woman who's a Spanish-speaking woman. She's got her little kid there with her in the car who can hear everything. And he says to her, you know, well, I'll pass your car if you'll go to the motel with me. And she's like, what? You know, because she's Spanish-speaking primarily, so she's like, have I misunderstood you? And he's like, says it again, two more times. I'll pass your car if you go to a motel with me. And she just marches into the station and goes to the officer supervisor and is like, this guy just said this thing. They bring her into a room and they begin to question her. Did you misunderstand? Are you know like, are you mis you know misperceiving the situation? Are you drunk? It's an incredible piece of yeah. audio. At, at like eight thirty in the morning. Are you drunk? Did you show up here to get your car? Like who goes to the CHP drunk to get their their VIN registration? I mean, it's absurd on its face. But that moment just kind of said so much more than the their report of that, which would have been like woman made complaint. You know. <laughs> Can I just say about that audio? I was in Afghanistan after the fall, and I listened to like a lot of podcasts to keep my mind off of what it is I'm doing. And I heard I was listening to on your on our watch, and I was just so distracted. I was like, I was in Afghanistan. I should have been focusing on what I was doing, but I was like, Can you believe this? Can you believe this happened? I was just to tell you. you. Because they are windows in, right? They are windows into what we cannot see. And so for the person who lived it. She's saying, no, I, this is what happened. This is what happened. But when you don't have something like that, that piece of audio that actually corroborates, it's so, it, that's where you see the power imbalance. And I think, I don't know if you had multiple moments of like going through that audio where it was just like, my God, this is, it's all here, right? Yeah, yeah, completely. Um, and, and so Corey and Asma, I'm wondering if you, where there was a moment in this going through everything that you were gathering where you had moments where you found this is, this is deeply unsettling. This is taking my story in a, in a different direction. So if, if anyone's seen the story or if they haven't, I would encourage you to look at the day one story at the top. There's this really striking video. Uh, that we internally have come to call the lead avalanche, uh, where um, the workers are going in a certain section of the plant, and one worker looks, there's an area in the plant, uh, and I think he might throws a pebble up there, and then all this lead just comes cascading down. And what I was told about that was that was to show how the ventilation system didn't work. That ventilation system is supposed to suck the lead that's, I mean, that's being, the dust that's being generated off of the breaking of the batteries and the furnace, and it's supposed to suck it out so those guys wouldn't get uh, exposed. And, and yet, it didn't work. It uh, hadn't worked for years. The company knew it hadn't, but they weren't spending the money to try to fix it. And that 
was like the first of many horrifying moments where we could see actual video mm-hmm. of what the atmosphere, how people were getting poisoned, how people were getting overexposed. And just, it wasn't just that either. It was, it was just the entire atmosphere where uh, they had problems with the floor. And so when they would be driving the loaders and they're carrying stuff, the loader would, would, would stumble, the stuff would fall out, and it would explode. And so we have a video of a guy who something explodes and sets his whole loader on fire, and he's running out of there, you know, for his life. So we could see we could see areas in the bag house where it's this section of the plant that gets all of the poisons and supposed to filter it out. And they had human beings in those, in those areas shaking the bags. They weren't supposed to. It's supposed to be an automated system that does it on its own. But, you know, for some reason, uh, this, this company, when they built the state-of-the-art uh, plant, uh, they decided to grab a bag house that was laying out in a junkyard somewhere and put it in the plant and put some paint over it and call it a day. And so they had this old bag house. Once the lead get to cooking, sulfur was being created and it was eroding the steel and eroding the bags, which then meant that the whole system was off. The plant couldn't c- keep producing because the bags were down, which meant that they needed to send as human beings in there and shake this stuff off. And so as they emerged, they're covered. They look like snowmen. They're covered in all these poisons. And we could see it. You know, the plant had this rule, has this rule, that uh, you can't have your cell phones in the building. And, and so as, you know, naturally, I mean, everybody had cell phones and everybody had pictures and, and photo. And so as we were interviewing folks and we started to see we said, hey, let me see your, your phone. Mm-hmm. And people had captured stuff that they didn't even quite know what it meant. And it, I think it absolutely gave power and force to the reporting where the usual things that people say to try to dismiss your stuff, they couldn't say anymore because people with their own eyeballs mm-hmm. could see it. Um, you know, the, you mentioned earlier, and, and I'll, I'll wrap up too, because there were so many horrifying moments. We need at least two, three hours of me <laughs> running my mouth. Uh, <laughs> but there was uh, that thing about ha- uh, having the guys just giving you bonuses if you kept your blood lead down. Um, How did you, when did you first <laughs> learn that? Well, um, we had heard it anecdotally. But we got a break and got to some, we'll just say, um, human resource type folks who had uh, the, you know, who had the the docs. And so we could see who got the money, who, you know, who didn't get the money. And I began to hear about how some of these folks were taking these pills to drop their levels right before the test. And if the pills didn't work, these chelation pills that essentially work like chemo chemo on the body they strip the body of everything they're very Even dangerous what you need right yeah and so th- some of them were taking that and if they weren't getting that to work some were actually going to donate blood right before the test um, and so they were dumping leaded blood into the community into uh, it's something that we still kind of try to put our arms around because the blood banks don't test for this they don't want to spend the money to test for it and so there have been academic studies that have found that uh, children particularly premature children they get blood transfusions in the hospitals and some of these children are getting leaded blood and it's either killing them or maiming them for life and so to know that that was happening as a result like the desperation around trying to get this last little bit of money was creating all this other chaos and what was last horrifying bit and then I'll shut up (laughs) what was horrifying to me was that the plant had the test results they knew what those levels were they knew how it was but when some of the guys blood lead would get high instead of saying they would they would blame them well that's what was they would say you're not washing up more in fact we're getting ready to put you on a on a on a performance payment a performance plan. We're gonna write you up, and if you don't improve, you're out of here. And they did get rid of folk because they couldn't get. So the plant knew the deal, 
but they were gaslighting these employees around it and and that that just gave it an extra kind of dimension to it that you know kind of sits with me to this day Mm -hmm. Uh, it's one of the things that stays with you from the yeah the entire series it's it's unbelievable Asma, what about you? Were there was yeah. there a moment where you just yes? So I mean, I mean, there are y- you'd mentioned the looking like a video game, and and I just want to give credit where it's due. You know, I think that because of leaks over time from n- not just journalists but others, people working within the military, uh, you know, we have a view of that. I think back to uh, I think it was a WikiLeaks publicized video from 2010 called Collateral Murder where you could actually hear people talking and they sounded like they were playing a video game. Um, And I think it was two Reuters journalists who were killed in this um, operation. But so I would see some things like that and I, I would find them startling, but I think it was, it was often, it was something that might be a little bit more, it was seeing the system and structure in total that I think sometimes really got me because the documents themselves might look innocuous. They might be like, we detected no civilian presence. We did this, we did that. We conducted this airstrike. And then it would be visiting on the ground and realizing, you know, the extent to which what they were doing was essentially creating a process in which they do very little that would actually result in detecting civilians, but do so in a manner that allows them to say they didn't see any civilians. Therefore, they're, of course, they're not deliberately targeting civilians. Of course, they're not doing this disproportionately. It was cracking that system that, for me, was maybe the most arresting overall to see that this very thing that we use for accountability and to say that we do the most rigorous process in the world was, in fact, the very thing that protected us from any allegations of wrongdoing. Um, there was not a single allegation there's not a single finding of wrongdoing or disciplinary action in 1,300 of these reports. Like there were thousands of pages that we went through and not a single example of that. And you have the military saying, you know, well, we, we hold people accountable. We do. But when you see it in that systematic manner, I think it's really hard to, I think it's hard to continue to defend that process. Um, I remember one document, this is like in the first batch of records I got, where they described doing pre, you know, uh, pre-strike surveillance, and you know they present this strike on what they believe to be a chemical weapons factory, and you can see these maps in this document where you can see where they've outlined chemical weapons production facility, chemical chemical, chemical weapons storage facility. It looks great. It looks like they really have done their work, and they present this to an intelligence review board, and everyone in the room greenlights it except for someone who shouldn't be in the room, actually, uh, a representative from USAID, the, um, the development arm. For some reason, she's in this room looking at this, and she says, I actually think the three, the, the children that you saw, the 10 kids playing that we saw live in this compound based on the ground realities I have. I think we might kill them if we do this airstrike. And then it was ignored. The strike was carried out. A few days later, pictures of dead children surfaced online, and they did this report that I got my hands on in which this USAID official follows up, and she says, I, I tried to stop this. And then, because there was an image in that, this is back in 2020, I went to this site in Mosul. I was able to geolocate it to a neighborhood called Yabisat. And I met the brother, the, I first met the brother of, of someone who was killed in that. And he described you know, what they were doing, where the children used to play, and, you know, how they picked up the bodies of their children in pieces. And to know that that was preventable, and to see that person try to stop it, the only person who was not trained in analyzing intelligence was the only person who accurately analyzed it, right? Tried to stop it, and she was overridden. And it was such a stunning example of me confirmation bias, something I think the public is more aware of because of the Kabul strike and the extraordinary reporting of the Times' visual investigations team. And, you know, how once you see something as a threat, it's very hard to unsee that. And I saw that again and again, but here was this perfect example of how someone with ground realities had a different picture 
than people who just look at targets all day. And I think that's one that, that certainly has, has stayed with me as a, as a searing indictment of how we do this work. And speaking of accountability, one of the hardest things about investigative journalism is here you are having to become like experts on, you know, lead and, and all this technical, you know, and Suki, you, you're throwing out, you know, all these legal terms because <laughs> you've learned now what goes on and you're learning <coughs> about military airstrikes. But, but there is a moment of where you have to decide, the moment of readiness. When are we going to bring this to X, Y, and Z um, agency or company? Can you talk about readying yourself for those accountability interviews and, and what happened, what pushback you got? Because we know not everyone sat down and, and, and responded to, um, to your various questions. Corey, you wanna start? So, turns out federal government um, doesn't really like to sit down uh, and talk to uh, <laughs> small regional papers like that. Um, uh, which was disappointing. Uh, you know, I, I'm a friendly guy, you know. Um, but we, we did a lot of emailing, that sort of thing, and I usually don't like to email questions or findings. Um, I'd rather, you know, have a sit down with you. I'll tell you some general areas, but, but because of time pressures and whatnot, we had, you know, we had to do what we had to do. Plus, COVID gave everybody you know, real reasons for not wanting to be in the room, uh, per se. But uh, when we confronted the county regulators uh, about, you know, there's a, there was a part three in the series where we showed all the ways the plant had polluted the community. And there was a really important piece to it where we found that the, the plant had particularly juked the pollution numbers, that they knew the exact times when the government's pollution monitors, but the government has like four or five monitors that is there to collect samples in the air to know whether the plant is polluting. But in the government's infinite wisdom, they decided to only turn these monitors on one day, one 12 hour period, every six days. And in their wisdom, they published the schedule of when this was happening. Like you can go to the EPA's website and find the schedule. And so at least from 2009 to this very day, the plant generated its own calendar of when the, 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 the monitors would be turned on. And on those specific days and even leading up to those days, they prepped and, and prepared for how they were gonna behave from 12 o'clock to 12.01. Right, and they would turn on sprinklers and point it towards the monitors to make sure that any dust, but then and turn them off, you know, once that, that day was over. And so when we were able to get the this calendars and the internal screenshots, they would put it on the, they literally called it air monitoring day. <laughs> and they put it on the, in the break room with, you know, air monitoring day, here's the other days, don't you do this, don't you do that sent out the group email, this is air monitoring day, don't do it. And when we were able to get that and printed it out and we sat with the county regulators who were running these monitors and oh yeah, you know, the plant's doing really good. There's one of the best emissions and you know, we're very proud of our partnership, you know, all that. <laughs> and so we, we made copies and we plopped it down in front of them and to see them go through it and that look on that on their face um, and it was interesting uh, one of the one of the one of the guys a nice guy I mean these were not evil they're not evil people uh, one of the guys said well what are the can I just ask you what are the workers saying about this and us <laughs> 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 and I said, do you, you really want to know the answer to this? Uh, are we, can, can I just be candid? And he was like, yeah. And they said, man, they all believe y'all ain't going to do a goddamn thing about this. In fact, they say that this company is running circles around y'all. Mm -hmm. um, and they say to me, why even bother 
Ain't they say ain't nobody gonna read it, ain't nobody gonna care, and why should they blow up their spot for some stuff that ain't nobody gonna do a damn thing about it? And when I told them that, you could they were shook. Uh, but it, it was the truth. Mm -hmm. Um and so uh, I'm pleased, I mean, from that, and when the story ran, they went and they changed their schedule up and uh, they quit doing the, you know, they added random monitoring to, and as soon as they added random monitoring, guess what? They found that the lead was high, <laughs> right? Uh, and so funny how that happens, right? Uh, but, but yeah, that, to you, to the larger point, and what I what I see in both of these wonderful reporters' work is too often, maybe even increasingly, we're having to to do what the government won't do. Right, right. Um, we're having to become the government watchdogs, mm -hmm. um, and that's truly unfortunate. It's something that we, I think, as an industry and as a nation, we had, need to have a better conversation around how we're here particularly when it comes to regulation. I mean, what regulation looked like after Nixon got busted compared to what it looks like now is horrifying. It's horrifyingly bad. Um, this whole idea of partnership versus protection mm. is horribly bad. Um, and we don't talk enough about that to the American people so they can truly understand the value that we give as well as they, the American people need to get in the game a bit. Um, and so if not, that's why I'm like, if not for your work and not for your work, like, I mean, when I saw you a couple of weeks ago, I was just like, you, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have known what the hell the Pentagon was doing. And that was just, that to me, it, while obviously happy and pleased that she exists, happy and pleased that, <laughs> I'm barely existing, but I'm here. Um, <laughs> but, but in terms of resources, we have a yeah, lot like, less. Yeah, <laughs> like what the hell am I paying taxes for if, if I got to then turn around and do your damn job for you? <laughs> you know, that, that's, hmm. so yeah. On, on when to take something to the military, like I have a different approach. I start with them oftentimes. I like to weasel my way in. And so what I mean by that is I like to start with like a test case or something that I can follow in detail as a way into something. So I might start with a person like Bassem Razo and say, hey, I found this video. You know, did you conduct this airstrike? What happened here? And then I'll just kind of like build. It's like that book um, that you maybe read in kindergarten. If you give a mouse a cookie, they'll ask for the jar. <laughs> I love to ask for a cookie and then just like build and, you know, use what they've given me to get more. And, you know, I think early on of doing this work, I approached the military and said, I just want to learn how you're conducting this air war and some of your, uh, you know, your the ways in which you're fighting uh, ISIS, the ways in which you're preventing civilian casualties, the way you're thinking about victims. And I did this long interview um, with a senior DOD official, a CENTCOM official actually, and you know, towards the end he's like, hey, you should come out to Qatar and you should see our, our air base. And I was like, I would love to do that. And I continued to do my work and as things became a little bit more testy, they were less keen on my coming to see this air base, but I, you know, I kind of pushed back and I was like, oh, but Colonel Ryan said I should do this. And I kind of like name dropped and like things moved along and they were like, okay, we'll give you this embed. But, um, you know, we, we have to delay it a few months. And they kept delaying and delaying and delaying. And, and I think they just thought my deadline would elapse. But what they don't realize is that freelancers don't have the same kinds of deadlines <laughs> um, <laughs> as somebody within a newsroom. And there's no way I would have been able to do years long, uh, you know, like five years of investigation um, or two years or whatever, you know, the, the amount of time that I was doing these within if I was solely on a desk and somebody counting my minutes <laughs> and time. But you know, eventually they were like, well, you can come, but we're going to need your IP address for er every single, like they wanted any digital device I was bringing into Qatar. They wanted the details of it. I had to get a business visa. And I just remember being like, you know what? I'm not bringing any of those devices into the country. And they said, will you sign an agreement 
uh, telling us that, that you're going to be doing that? And I said, yes, and I did. And on the same day that I arrived in Qatar, so did my little sister, who had a fabulous day at the Ritz-Carlton and brought in a lot of computers and cell phones <laughs> and, you know, um, and she had a really good time in Doha while I did my embed. And in true, and you know, when I did these, like, these long interviews that I built into this explainer of the coalition air war, it was just like tons of interviews that wound up becoming like the basis for a lot of future work. But as I left, like literally I stepped onto a plane to go back to Iraq after this embed was over and I hit send <laughs> on like the first 60 coordinates for the airstrikes I had visited and been like, I'd like you to check these coordinates. And they said like, no, we can check four. And we had this like ugly back and forth and eventually they had to check them all and then and more. But I like to build and I like to wait until I get what I have or need and then ask for more. And then at some point you have so much they can't they can't ignore you. They can't say no. Like you now have what you have. And I think that they kind of with the records, they were being released to me, but I don't think it was going all the way up to the top or something because they were, I think in the end taken aback by what I was able to do in that number of years, which was visit as many of them on the ground. And, you know, I, I just want to, if, if I may, I, I did something, when you have more time, I think you can experiment more with models of journalism. And something I'm really proud of that's detailed extensively in the magazine story is that, you know, I worked with locals from Mosul. In fact, two students from the University mm -hmm. of Mosul yeah. who were, uh, they were in the Department of Translation, and they'd never done journalism, but I was like, hey, I'm, I'm a journalism educator anyway. So I was like, I'll teach you investigative journalism, and we can work together, and it was more of a mutual, um, you know, it was mutually beneficial in so many ways, but also like, you know, and I had students from um, Columbia from my conflict reporting class who were getting involved in the database because of, uh, I just know the way I learned back when I was at Frontline was just, learning from people directly, like some of these great investigative journalists, getting to see how they do their work. So opening up that process made it possible to do this work on the ground with, with students in Mosul and to you know, operate. And I think that's also an essential part of it that I, I want to say this only because you know, we're talking about me against the military, but it's obviously you know, these sources who've opened it up and made it possible for me to do that work. And then people I've gotten to know and work with closely who are extraordinary journalists in their own right, like Momin um, Mohaned, who, who is uh, really fantastic on the ground with me in, in Mosul. And thank you for saying journalist, and I think we need to abolish the word fixer. <laughs> um, <laughs> there is a good I conversation <laughs> going on around that, but they are, they're collaborators, they're journalists, they're doing field work. Yeah. And that's important. Yeah, I mean, what are f you can't really fix a sample, right? You have to <laughs> show up unannounced. <laughs> you need to be out in the field like I I, <coughs> I I think that if somebody does logistics you can describe them as such or if somebody does uh, journalists you can describe them as such but some of these terms are definitely outdated and that's one that you know I think is extremely problematic in this industry and enough people don't really talk about the way in which that kind of international reporting is is often done right. um, and how you can empower journalists in these countries to tell their own stories and like invest in them. And that's something I would encourage is not just to just hire somebody who's worked before or done a lot of this work, but to actually train and invest in, I you know, over the long term. I think that that can be even more transformative. And Suki, when you <laughs> came, w in terms of your accountability interviews, I mean, there were some extraordinary <laughs> moments in some <laughs> of these pieces where People are disappearing. They're quitting their jobs <laughs> before you can even talk. To them. Sharon Henry, where's Sharon Henry? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I I have like a, a kind of mixed bag approach. I would say, like the I I also try to do the like ask for the cookie. I love that. I'm gonna <laughs> steal that. <laughs> um, the like let's just make contact. Like I'm you know I'm just interested in you know learning more about how your systems work and very kind of non-confrontational and like friendly. Um, and I also do a lot of like cultivating of like the people I, I uh, coordinate with to get the records who are usually like clerks and you know people who are kind of like this is just my job or attorneys and like finding out kind of background information from people and building like you know 
good cordial relationships of like thank you so much for doing this work thank you for getting these records for me just like building kind of you know my nice personality <laughs> and then and then I when I'm like gonna sit down for like a you know uh, interview I know it's gonna be a little heavier a little more confrontational like I really do map it out um, I spend a lot of time like if they'll only answer one question you know what question do I need to at least ask because I, I might may not get an answer but um, you know doing that and really kind of thinking through ways to um, to get people to answer questions and you know while I, I did get some people to go on the record a lot of people I did not you know and a lot of um, especially like the the higher ups in policing they're like oh it's a personnel matter so for legal reasons we can't talk and so that was just like over and over again you know like the CHP that just sends me their little like we never do anything wrong and everything's great and I'm like this is not even believable like why why are you doing this like I sent you this detailed list of questions about how you know these cases fell through the cracks um, but you know, they, they do have liability issues with officers because officers have so many rights. And so I think that was like one of the most revealing moments for me was in that interview with the police chief in Rio Vista that's in episode one. And there's, you know, the first episode, in case you haven't heard it, details the case of this woman who called 911 for help. She heard somebody messing with her car or something. And it um, it had was the seventh time that she'd called the police in the last two weeks and so they're getting fed up with her and they show up with this plan that this time they're going to arrest her for um, abusing harassing 911 and they everything kind of goes sideways and this police dog gets out of the car you know maybe accidentally and rips her arm up and it's it's just truly horrific um, and then the police chief decides to do an investigation and investigates the two officers who responded and fi finds out like they kind of lied on their reports and kind of fudged things to cover their asses. And so he disciplines them, but in that whole internal investigation, they never talked to the woman whose arm was ripped up. And I'm asking the chief, I'm like, so like, why didn't you ever talk to her? Um, like when your investigator ever <laughs> communicate with the victim. Um, and he was like, uh, we didn't need to. It wasn't necessary for the investigation. You know, we had the body cam footage. And that word necessary was so kind of hit me and was like, oh, shit, this is a risk management system. This is not an accountability system. And just like you were saying, Asma, like understanding how it's not that the system is broken. It was built this way on purpose and so kind of going from that perspective like while it you know I think it would behoove a lot more you know police chiefs to do interviews and to be more like engaged in the accountability questions that I and many many other journalists have I also think that they're so committed to that system that often those interviews can be not very useful because they're like, no, this is the way, you know, we have liability issues. This is the way it is. And so sometimes you're just kind of like, what, <laughs> if there's no true kind of engagement with the harm and with the subject, then they can be just like, you know, not, not very good. <laughs> but I will say also that there were, you know, many uh, people who talked to me off the record, you know, police, um, people who worked in internal affairs, people who worked in policing, um, who really did want to see the system change and were so incredibly frustrated by how it's, how it's built to avoid accountability and to allow people who um, engage in corruption to continue to you know, work on the force. So I want to say that too. So I, wanna, I know we have microphones going around. I do want to open it up to questions. Um, does anyone have any questions immediately? There's, is there a mic person? Corey, uh, Rod Boyd Foundation for Financial Journalism. Great work. Uh, who owns this goddamn company that that 
is killing all these people and is it owned by in turn by a private equity fund or is it publicly traded because this is a company that needs to have an entirely different set of risk disclosures if it's publicly traded i think so initially it was privately owned uh privately owned for m decades by a family out of minnesota uh, called the kutoffs um and right around 2018 uh, the Kutoff sold it to one of these funds, one of these equity funds, um, and the guy who's the CEO of that that fund, uh, Doug Kennelman, I think it might be mispronouncing, but he's a very prominent campaign contributor. In fact, he was a big Trumper, big financer of Trump's campaign, and has his tentacles everywhere. The private in it, uh, the private fund may be publicly traded, but the company the plan itself is not um but what is fascinating was when the stories published uh we started to get calls from investors uh, i'd never had that happen before where uh, in fact i frankly i thought it was the private eyes in disguise uh where they were calling and said well that was a really good story um do you plan on doing more <laughs> and when the next one and the next one um and uh, but what ended up happening was the credit rating agencies, uh, Moody as well as uh, the other major one, uh, did investigations, and Moody's downgraded their credit based upon uh, and what they saw in the story and the videos and whatnot. And so there, there's been the financial accountability that has happened as a result. That's just absolutely humbling to see because, you know, the money people just really, generally the money people just really want the money to keep flowing. Um, and so to see that happen was, was deep. Hi, um, fascinating panel. Um, when you're doing these long-term investigations and talking to sources who have been wronged and people that may not know what has happened to them until you come to them, and then like Corey was saying, they start to talk amongst each other and it's just things start bubbling up in the community. Maybe they start posting to social media. Um, the story starts to have a life of its own that starts to get out of your control um, before you've had a chance to publish. <laughs> um, that's just something that could happen. I'm, I'm curious if, if you've had to sort of address that experience in your reporting where you're sort of, you're stirring the pot and getting sources to talk to you and you wanna you want more people to talk to you, but you also want to, you want to, you want to break the story. How do you, how do you handle that with your sources to get them to continue to want to speak to you, but also not sort of, um, you know, have the sort of splash. Either a national, you know, a bigger publication comes by and sees that and does their own thing, or so. How do you keep it within your control? That's a really good question. I actually, um, I've had that happen before, where the story really actually happened when I worked. Here at CR, uh, at CR, where uh, it, the story leaked out and they got ahead of us before we published. What, what I would, what I do with sources is say, look, uh, I can't control what you what you do, what you say. I'm not going to even, I'm not even in that bag. And uh, you know, I say, and it's very hard for you to sit down and hear this stuff and not want to tell somebody. Um, and so I'm not going to begrudge you for doing that. I said, what I will ask, though, is we're not there yet. And if you trust me long enough to get it together, you know, we, we want this to change. We don't want this just to be a story that drops and does nothing. So if we can just kind of hold our horses for a while, I promise you, you know, you know, I'll give you the signal. You can tell your mama, your, your daddy, you can, you can scream it from the rooftops. But if you just give me enough time to get it right first, I said, it's not just, I said, it's not just this little thing I showed you, but we got to get to the why. We got to get so many other things we still need to get. And what I have found is if you're straight up with folks like that, um, they'll temper themselves, uh, you know, to, to work with you. But if it happens, it happens. I mean, the blessing of these kind of stories, the blessing and the curse is they're, they're elephants. And so they're not, you know, unless you're the New York Times, Washington Post, you know, ProPublica. Uh, 
your average, you ain't got to worry, you really, no diss to Channel 9s or anything, but you really don't have to worry about Channel 9 running in trying to do the lead story, right? Uh, you know, they'll, they'll get somebody with a, do a stand up outside the plant, but, so you know, I'm not worried so much about that. Um, and, but I, what I found is if you, if you just keep it straight with people, Donald try to control them, because if you tell me somebody screwed me over, and then say be be quiet for eight, nine, ten months. That's gonna be hard. But what I will say is, say just work with me on this. I'll keep you in the loop. I'll keep talking, cause it's not there yet. And if we rush this thing out too soon, it could fail. I, I just want to add on to that. That was fantastic. Um, you need to demonstrate your worth, not just worth in terms of you know what you can do for that person through telling the story in that way, but the manner in which you operate, like the ethics in which you operate. And I'll just give you an example. Like Basim Razo, I knew he would be the main character in The Uncounted. And, you know, af you know, there was a period of time where no one cared about the air war. And then once Trump was elected to office, suddenly people started, journalists wanted to report on this. And here's this case I've been following and people were reaching out to him. And I'd always been keeping him in the loop and showing him what, what I had found by, you know, asking him questions. Like, here's what the military has told me. Here's what, you know, I've learned about this. What do you think about this? Um, so he saw, like, the value of the work I was doing, but he also saw the way that I treated him. And I'll give you an example. Um, he, I, I was supposed to get the night of, um, the night of the airstrike from him um, for the magazine story. And, like, in a magazine story, you need to tell that in such intimate detail, right? And so I needed that in intimate detail, and there was a period of time where I was supposed to get it after months of knowing him. I'm on, I'm on this trip to Iraq, and I, it's one of the deliverables I'm supposed to come back with. And every day we have lunch, you know, he, we're supposed to do this. He says, Azmat, I'm having such a good day. Like, I don't want to be in a bad mood. Can we do this tomorrow? And he did that every day for the entire trip um, that, that I saw him. And I came back without it, and somebody was like, what were you doing? And I was like, well, a lot of other things, but like building trust. And there's a chance it may not work, right? So I was you know, developing other sources, trying to imagine the story without the night of. But we got to a place and a point where he felt comfortable talking about it. And he also knew that there was no one else who would do that, right? There would be n no one else who would likely see him beyond the strategic value that they can use in their story. Um, and I think that that translated not just to him, but other people, and he spoke to others, right? So like he would, you know, at some point, I think he became quite protective of me and he'd hear I was going to Huija and he'd be like, I need to come with you. <laughs> and um, so sometimes he would, he would come with me to these places and he would talk to people and he would tell them about, and that was really helpful to have. And I had a lot of other survivors and interviewees do that. And if you can build that trust, if you can demonstrate that worth, and then on the other hand, if other institutions are covering it, you know, I think one of the advantages of system of investigative journalism, is, as Daphne was saying, is not just, you know, this it's this time that you have, but it's also the means to pursue something systematically. So let's say you're competing with the Times or ProPublica or somebody bigger who might be doing this, make them have to take you on because they don't want to compete against you. You have something that is so much bigger and better than whatever thing that they may be looking at on that subject, they have to bring you on or they have to compete against you. And, you know, it's better, <laughs> it's better to take you on than, than deal with that result if you really pursue something in a systematic manner. Can I jump in on, on something you said really quick? I'm trying not to be preachy on this at all. Um, but you referred to something, and I've been aching to say this um, tonight is, uh, and if it's fortune cookie for some of y'all, forgive me, but one of the advantages that we have, um, which allow us to defeat any, uh, uh, what, are, what are these non-disclosure agreements and threats of prison and, all of this stuff is the gift of listening. Like there are so many Americans, so many human beings out here who have never really been listened to, who aren't heard, they're not seen. And I think one of the things that, <laughs> when I've been, you know, the story is popular, so people have been asking me to talk to young people. And one of the things that I've been preaching is that 
the young people need to get away from the temptation of Twitter and the cell phone texts and trying to conduct all their business through the cell phone texts because in order to truly do this thing that we're doing, we absolutely have to connect with people. People have to see us, they have to feel us um, in order to, and they have to feel seen and heard. And if you give a human being the gift of truly listening, not with judgment, but just listening, they'll give back to you. People, they won't say, sometimes they will, but most times people don't say thanks for listening to me, but they'll give back to you. In, in ways that absolutely help. And so I think I just wanted to reiterate to the degree a lot of us, because it's time pressure. Your editor need the stuff, you you know, blah, blah, blah. And so you send that little text and and then look with this one. I don't know if I ever hear back from anybody. I sent an email. <laughs> but <laughs> I know. if to the degree you can safely get in that car or train or bus and get to people it's the degree your success rate on something bigger is just going to go up off the up the up the roof i think and that's what that's why the cia and the fbi and the corporations and all the other people they the white house and they can't really hold us down because people they screwing people up in these businesses or people see stuff and then we show up and we give them a listen and then they they're going to dump all that on us and uh, and allow us to carry the torch on and so to the degree that we lean into that strength we, we absolutely need to do it anyone else Okay, you and then the person back there who's... All right. Hello. Uh, Jonas Franke here from Disruption Network Lab in Berlin. We just did a conference in March called The Kill Cloud about uh, the drone strikes, uh, the second one we have done, uh, with a number of, uh, of drone whistleblowers, American ones. And so for us, Matt, I was wondering uh, what, if you got, what kind of response you got from inside of the military, because I think the, especially what you said about the, uh, the systematic... Um, uh, yeah, how the system is set up to avoid accountability uh, is something that I think resonated there as well. Both like the the shame uh, that these uh, whistleblowers uh, feel for uh, um, not yeah, not not like not being able to to measure their own possibilities, um, and uh, at the same time the repression they they get afterwards, uh, and in other some other countries also like physical repression inside of, of the, the the military so yeah it's just uh, I, I think that, like they, they would have mm, they feel such relief and solidarity when they hear uh, like someone that is able to prove or bring out like to show uh, that this is the situation that they were in and if they were not able to speak out while they were inside that this was why yeah. That is such an excellent question, and, and thank you for your work on this subject. Um, so, you know, after The Uncounted came out, I was shocked by the number of sources, and this is like back in 2017, 2018, who came to me and wanted to tell me things. And because of exactly what you talked about, which is military this sources? military sources, people who are on the inside of doing this work, um, the number of them that wanted to tell me what they had seen, heard, knew. And, you know, a lot of it was because of the retaliation that occurs. Like, I've been very careful about how I've included them. And in fact, I've often used what they've told me as the basis for asking for a particular record or going to the site of an incident they've told me about. I would never just, you know, I know there are people who will write about you know, something that, that is based on sources within the military, um, but it's important to me to get to that place on the ground, and it's important to try to get documentation that I can stand up that is not just that person who, you know, my editor will ask me rightly, let's name them, why can't we, what do we say here, you know, so I, you know, I, I can't tell you how helpful sources were to me in terms of understanding these records, which are filled with redactions, military jargon, things that only people who are writing them would know. 
Um, and in addition to that, like so many stories that came from, you know, after The Uncounted came out, somebody told me about a strike on a dam that could have killed tens of thousands of people in Syria. And I didn't come out and say, here's this source who told me this thing. I went to the site of it and I fought for documents into that strike and it became the basis for a story that had sources on the inside and including you know, that first individual who approached me, but also tons of people on the ground who were working at that dam. Um, and then a document about it. And so you know, for me, uh, that retaliation against them is a driving force for the let me get this every other way I can and let me also protect them and then include their voices where I'm able to. So for example, in the civilian casualty files, oh, I have this genius editor on the, but all of my editors are just amazing, amazing. Um, but you know, I turned in a 20,000 word draft for the newspaper story and Paul Fishletter, who I know David can tell you is like just an extraordinary editor, you know, helped me make this 10,000 words. And so we had little space, you know, to get to, like every single thing somebody had told me, but we included where we could because I wanted some of these people to see themselves too in the story. They contributed in numerous ways, but I wanted them to see some of their own, the framing that only they could give mm -hmm. to say like, we actually use this for cycle. It's not just to project accountability to the, ac to the outside world. It's also so that we can feel psychologically better. We use this process to feel better about the strikes we do. The kinds of framing they could add. So I put those quotes in there for that reason. Um, but I was driven, and I think because of the time I had, I don't think you need to have to, you know, go on the ground or, you know, um, be in these places necessarily. You can use incredible visual investigations tools. Um, there's someone in this room, Haley Willis, who I'm going to make stand up because I'm so obnoxious. Sorry, Haley. <laughs> who, <laughs> <laughs> who did amazing reporting based on the files um, on a story that uh, looked at like unfair dismissal dismissals of civilian casualty incidents um, using you know open source intelligence technique tools and so you know anybody can do this and you know she also got sources who did some of these assessments and was able to work that into a story and so I think my own approach because of the time I had has been to you know utilize that but not put anyone at risk to the best extent possible um, while also still giving a sort of systematic look of, of how that unfolds. I think we have time for one more. Someone had the microphone back there. Go ahead. Uh, hi, yes, I'm Rosina Breen, soon to, soon to join the uh, Bureau of Investigations. Um, you've all given really profound examples of human-focused investigations with strong institutional corporate accountability. And I was just wondering whether you start with the human story first, essentially to democratize um, as a point of an investigation. I mean, I think the, the, the really, the great investigations absolutely uh, are people-based. Um, and I think it depends on the nature of the story, how you particularly start but there's no story that's going to expose wrongdoing that doesn't involve people and, and shouldn't, to the degree possible, give your reader a sense of who people are. I mean, uh, I've been hearing more and more from people way smarter than me that readers need to connect with people. They don't necessarily, as good as data is and how you know fascinating it is, that isn't the, the numbers numbers are impressive it gives it gives some a reader a chance to feel like oh this is real but it's it's the human beings in those stories that make that either gives you the outrage or gives you the connection or makes you cry or makes you even motivated to want to read more or to do something after you've read the story um, and so to that i just say absolutely the, if you're trying to do impactful work human beings, it's, it's always going to involve human beings and trying, to, but even in terms of democracy, I would argue that with all the division and the strifes and the fault lines, the, the more we can show the university, the universality of human beings, that we all bleed, we all cry, we, we all struggle, um, 
one quick point on that is, you know, I work in a very conservative area um, and wondered if, you know, you know, they don't really like the Tampa Bay Times. And so, so when you publish something and you see the comments, it's just a it could be a nightmare seeing the people, you know, attack it and, and all of this. But on this story, we didn't get that. Uh, and what that said to me is no matter racial creed, no matter what, there still exists uh, a universal sense that a human being should be able to go to work and not be hurt, not be harmed. And that even though these were immigrants and blacks and some of the usual fodder for whatever, you know, people saw that that man, that's not right. You know, that man, that man is in there working hard to try to feed his family. And so I was kind of impressed and inspired by the lack of venom and and the where that we got from these stories that it didn't bring out the usual people to go fake news and you know them people you know they just want to hand out and you know and so I think it's instructive that more and more if we can get to human beings and get their stories and put them in front of the world I'm not going to sit up here and say it's going to solve all the the ills of society but I think it does make human beings smarter and maybe even a little more fairer uh, when, we, when we succeed at doing that. I'll, I'll say for um, my project, I mean, we didn't, in a way, didn't start, start with people because we started with records and we just did like this massive public records request to every law enforcement agent and was like, wonder what we're going to get. <laughs> and so kind of used, I would say, um, you know, the public records process to begin to see trends. And then from there, you know, certain stories came to me, I would say, that represented those trends. And like some of the stories that I investigated, you know, ended up on the radio as a four minute, you know, radio feature, which was a, a wonderful like benefit, I would say, I would have as like a person who is both a, a daily reporter who works for a public radio station and working on a long investigative project because I, I didn't have to like sacrifice like some stories that were n maybe not as representative and so I didn't want to include in the podcast, but I could use them and still um, contribute to daily news coverage and also kind of test things out. And so like you know, some of the, the first episode in particular, it was only because we reported on it that then it became more of a story because the, the criminal charges that the woman was still facing were dropped on the basis of our reporting. And so the reporting it out and, and publishing along the way was really like helpful to me um, in terms of, uh, you know, just both, <laughs> both kind of moving through so much material and being like, well, I don't want to like, I, you know, this person has told me their, you know, their most terrible moment um, where they lost their loved one to police violence. I'm not going to, you know, kind of put it by the wayside, but also, um, you know, n needing to kind of get it out through, through the local outlet versus doing a, a long form, you know, narrative podcast about it. So I'm just grateful for that and also want to encourage people who, um, are doing investigative work to to think about that, like to to give pieces away if you you know if you think they'll be valuable to local news, um, and so that was one thing I wanted to say. Um, and just just to add to that, from you know for anybody who's doing international reporting, you already have a smaller audience to tap into because of interest levels in the United States and what people can relate to, what they want to follow, and so you really need to draw out those human stories and focus on some of the universal aspects of things. And for me, it's often been like the love of family mm -hmm. and like the love of a parent or, you know, a grandmother. And if you have some time um, to listen to the daily podcast episode that I did in, I think it came out like January 18th, but it recounts, you know, something that's also in the magazine story, but you know, this grandmother, her name was Katbea, and you know, I'd gotten a document that said they'd looked at this house, they'd seen three children on the roof, and, you know, they still believed it to be, you know, s uh, something that was an ISIS target, despite 
you know, seeing those children. They could have reevaluated it, realized the target they actually wanted was across the street, but they were more convinced that this was, you know, an ISIS target and they hit this house. And, you know, taking that to the grandmother who's lost 10 of her family members in that airstrike and, you know, getting her permission before I told her the details of the document and that they saw the children and hearing her say, like, the kids used to go on the roof because it was cold to get sun and to warm up. And to hear her say that they died without eating dinner. And then to ask her, like something I ask all the survivors I interview, if you could tell the US military anything, what message would you want to tell them? And I can't tell you the number of people that wrote to me after hearing her, after reading her, who said, I was sobbing for that grandmother. Mm -hmm. And you know, I could have done all the data-driven investigation in the world, but without having those kinds of universally human stories to make that understandable, to make those numbers meaningful, I r my reporting would have had far less resonance. Because a grandmother is a grandmother is a grandmother. Yeah. Suki, Asma, Corey, thank you so I much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Seriously.